Hello, welcome once again to the program, How to Control Your Emotions. And uh, I was just kibitzing with the audience here this evening about the mysteries of life and how I thought Jesus was when he was here. He still is, by the way. When he's here in the flesh, um, how he changed uh, water into wine and Moses dividing the Red Seas. And I marvel at the, the mystery and the magic that's gone out of religion. And I could never accept religion, the deadness of it. You people feel the deadness of religion. Yeah. You know, sing song and every day, rock of ages. <laughs> you know, you know, you, those guys are stoned. <laughs> They're religiousized. You know, and you have the boogie walking down the aisle. That's not religion either. And, uh, and I marvel at the fact that, you know, it becomes so dead when, when Moses was so alive and he was able to affect matter. And of course, such a person who can affect matter must be in, in time and space. Must be beyond, must be beyond the reach of time and space. There must be eternal beings. Because only that which is capable of affecting matter is, well, from that which created matter. See, all of us are related to the world. We're subject to the world like animals. And somehow we know there's something wrong with that. We, we, we're better than that, but yet the reality of it, we wake up in the morning, and especially if you haven't painted your cell with bright colored um, curtains and TV and play on the drums and turn on the TV and you brighten up your, and you make it look, your hell look like a paradise. But if you went out in the, in the world of reality and just sat there, it's kind of bleak. Something's missing. And that's why you have to have your drums. Uh, imagine the first person that came on the earth. He fell from this paradise state to this magical state where he could live forever and affect material things rather than being affected by material things. I imagine he felt pretty bummed out pretty bored without the life that he had, had to create his own life. He had to interact with things. He had a black kitten playing with a ball of string. He had imagined things were lurking around the corner. And probably, otherwise he couldn't get a, couldn't, nothing would turn him on. We, you know, we're creatures of our environment, but we ought not to be creatures of our environment. And, and, but we are, and we've fallen away from what is real, from a paradise state where we could affect through our consciousness, through being the observer of the world, not subject of the world, but subject to him who created the world, we could actually magically affect things for the good and be co-creators. Not creators, we want to be creators, that's, our, that's why we fall, it's called pride. And we're separated from the magic. And then we're bummed out because we thought we could be gods and we turn out to be dogs, <coughs> and we haven't got any magic. And uh, what I want to do is put the magic back into life again, and it's working for me. I'm just, you know, touching the tip of the iceberg. <coughs> Excuse me. But I know that if I... It's the strangest thing. You've heard preachers talk about it, and you've heard maybe read people write about it. But I could tell you honestly, and I don't want to brag about it, because it spoils it. You brag about it, and your ego gets in the way, <coughs> excuse me, and you fall away from the, what it is that's doing it. Um, you know, you brag about the fact that you're just about to make a good deal, and sure as hell it's going to fall through. Happened to you, hasn't it? See, so, if, if things happen and you can't brag about it, that's it. You'd like to brag about it, but you know, you better not, because you can't take the credit for it, because if you take the credit for it, it's gone. And I, I'd like to be able to create the magic in this room, but I can't create it on call. See, I can't divide the Red Seas or turn wine and in, water into wine. I may be able to turn the wine into water. That's about to say. A million dollars into a dollar, but a dollar into a million dollars. You know? <laughs> so there's a mystique to it. And that you cannot, on, on by will, create 
Like you've got constipation, you know, try to make something happen. Will, mm. for effort. <laughs> <laughs> Turn red in the face and nothing happens. <laughs> you know, Moses, he didn't decide that he wanted to divide the Red Seas. He says, uh, God said to him, now, wave your magic wand, lift up your staff and see what I'm going to do through you. And lo and behold, he was... I guess it scared the pants off of himself. <laughs> and that's the effect. It, you have to have that humility, and you've got to be the conduit. But you've got to have that humility to be a conduit and see what happens through you. The very fact that you try to change things or affect things is really a counter to the fact that things are affecting you. If you want to dominate someone, it's only because you've been dominated. You're trying to get it back power. It's the wrong kind of power because then you're being in a big, you're in, you know, you're, you're ruling in hell. You're not ruling from heaven. In this world where, you know, a dog-eat-dog -dog world, you're either the dog on top or the dog on the bottom, but you're still a dog. You're either eating or being eaten. The sense of power is only a sense of power. And I don't want this power to come from fantasy either. There are those of you, there are those people in this world, and we were talking in the last program on fantasy and imagining. Um, there are those who teach you that if you imagine something, you can actually make it happen. You have sort of a holograph projection and you can give it form. Well, that's close to the truth, but it's not, not close enough to the truth. Um, you must be very careful of trying to make things happen with your imagination. Because last week I spoke about the fact that when you're lost in your imagination, you try to create like a god does, so that it, things in your imagination become real because you're in, you're in, you are, um, have descended into your creation. Creating. You're the god of your own creation, except your creations often turn on you and rebel against you and destroy you. And they become all-powerful. Yes. What about, what about worrying? Isn't that a form of... You liked that opening, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you got it's you, like... got you going already, have I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, but because worrying, I know how worrying plays on your mind. Worrying, worrying is a form of faithlessness. Okay. You but want it's to, not imagination? Worrying pulls you into your imagination. Oh, okay. Worrying creates a negative projection because when you're worrying, it's like faith. So, in other words, it creates more things to worry about. And you think when you worry, you're being creative. You think when you worry, you have a false sense of being good or concerned for your, ch properly concerned for your children. Now, any person in this room knows when you've had a mother worrying about you, what kind of effect that has on you, right? Why are they worrying? If they think it's of, of as a goodness, what the truth of the matter is, they're escaping goodness, to be their own goodness because only out of worry can they invent their own goodness. See, they can escape the truth of, of all the mistakes they made the last time they worried. See, so they can, in other words, they can escape in the flurry of activity of their imagination. Now, this flurry of activity of the imagination is caused by the mistake they made, the projection which comes from worry. So when you make a mistake, when you worry, up comes an answer which isn't which is not human, it's from some other world. In other words, it's error that looks like rightness, like a right act. Or it may not be a deed, it may be just a feeling that comes from a person who worries about you. Oh, mom, don't worry about me. You know, you get bothered, affected. You feel belittled by someone worrying. You feel the negativeness of their worry. You feel like, you know, you feel their fears for you and then you get, become paralyzed and you start making the mistakes they worry about. Behold. The thing I fear most, says Job, has come upon me. Worry is a negative faith, but it's the only faith you know how to have. It's the only way you know how to come up with an idea, a new idea, which is the answer to a problem. But the last problem you may have came by the same process. Someone worrying, or you worrying. Mm -hmm. And you being the pro you projecting, or you being someone's projection. Worry, there's two, two modes, <coughs> excuse me, there are two modes of, of consciousness. Unconsciousness and consciousness. 
Now, in our life, we live our, a life of denial. In our ego state, in our fallen, uh, disenfranchised, non-paradisical state, lost state, it's a state of called pride, where we're trying to be our own god. And we try to be a god in our own world of imagination. And just like God, as I said before, in his world, has imagined everything to existence. His things are real. And in his projection, his present spirit projecting into, into, into consciousness and into, into ideas and into emotions and into, into form, into energy, into form. They are real and they are good because he is good. But when we play God, we are losing ourselves in the imagination, which is, we have a framework, we are made in the image of that creator, so we have a mind very similar to what God's mind is, but we're a little tiny replica of the, of the grand, the, the grand ego of the universe. So we, have, we can do the same thing. We can also come into our mind and start creating. But it is Satan that draws us into our own mind because it draws us away from knowing God into knowing ourselves as God. And we think there, we are deluded by the lie that is there, that we can think things and they be. And we can imagine things that they be, and that's a lie. Because that's how the hell comes into existence. And this is called ambition. Now, just frame that word. We are taught to be imagining, ambitious, imaginative, Creative, we call it. We can't be creative. We're not God. There's no way in the world. So, big deal. How much is Michelangelo's work worth? Millions of dollars. Van Gogh? He was crazy. Who else would cut off his ear yeah. for a girlfriend? You know, but his work of art, they're considered creations. I think they're crap. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I see reality. Okay, so the guy can paint. Big deal. <laughs> so everybody applauds his painting. Oh, wow, Van Gogh, you're wonderful. You're, and he thinks he's wonderful, and they think he's wonderful, and the people who think he's wonderful think they're wonderful for thinking he's wonderful. And they have a role model of what is wonderful because they're not wonderful. Because if they didn't have something they could involve themselves in, something what they call positive, some role model of how they can be. Well, he's, this man has managed to be worshipped by some little puny little creation. See, he inspires our respect and adulation. Therefore, if we love him and respect him, perhaps we will become a little bit of him. And maybe some of that genius will rub off on us as we become what we worship, see? And then maybe someone will worship us, see? But there's all this is pride, and all the little things we do, you know, we have a marvelous technological society, but, you know, it's, it's the result of, you know, millions of, of brains and discoveries and revelations. To yes, <clears throat> each man trying to be his own god, possibly, but there's also creative people out there co-creative people out there who've just really discovered things, <coughs> excuse me, and advanced the civilization to its present state. But rem remember, the cleverness is only a very small, tiny part. After all, I got a microphone here. It probably took, you know, 500 men three lifetimes, you know, to, to, to perfect this. So one person got an idea, another person built on it, and, and, and so on and so forth until, but really, our genius is, you know, Edison started with a light bulb or whatever it was, and, and now we've got some pretty remarkable forms of light that we're using, lasers and things like that. But, but, you know, each one of us is only capable of, even in our material creation, of very small, small amounts of achievement. But we crow so much about it. We get so much energy and so much mileage out of it. See? After a while, some people, you know, are afraid to create because the adulation they get, and the love they get, and the respect they get goes to their head and makes their head as big as the Washington Monument. And, and this ego, the puffing up of their ego, conflicts it with reality. And it call, it's called anxiety, guilt. And they're, they're afraid to create, because after a while they start to find that they start having, 
they are, creations are negative. Because they feel so guilty, they feel uh, something's happened to their creativity that it becomes negative after a while, or they're afraid to create because of the guilt of taking the credit for it. You know what I'm saying? But some of you are afraid to succeed because when someone says, oh, how wonderful, look what he did, suddenly someone has puffed your ego up to the point where you may have come down for a moment to be swelled up with pride to accept the credit for that, but suddenly you've stopped being able to create. Who knows what I'm talking about? You do, don't you? See? And then we have a problem, because there is a true creation, but when you take credit for it, the creation stops. And then you try to create and you go mad. And if you do, if you do become successful, it's usually over a big nothing. Behold the art wor world. I mean, you ever hear such garbage in your life? Because, because they can't really create. They can't really come up with something new. So they come up with, you know, fried eggs and bacon sprayed with polyurethane paint. <laughs> or they take buckets of paint and manure and, and they start an airplane engine and they blow the stuff on the wall. And all the insane people comes to the point where creation itself becomes um, anything that God created, we start to hate. And we start to do things which well, are, are, are obscene and ridiculous, bizarre, and we start to worship that as if that was creation. So, we were talking about now bringing things, being truly creative like I am being creative this evening because I haven't prepared anything. As a matter of fact, I must admit, I had something in mind to tell you, but it, it got blown away. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> I mean, I want to talk to you about time and space and my... And there's some, some such neat things about that, but I don't know if you're going to be ready for that, so I had to get you in here somehow. <laughs> but we got... Yeah, we'll... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to lead up to it because we've got two and a half hours, you know, actually five programs for the viewers. And uh, I don't mind if you're going to interrupt me because I, uh, yes, there's, there's some, I'm sure that you just maneuver yourself into position whenever you see a hand go up and I'll, yes, ma'am, um, you're getting my message so far, are you? Yes. Okay. I wanted just to, before you skip and go to another subject, on creativity, women have been given credit for creating children at birth. They're given that, well, look at that looks just like you. The e ego image in creativity is, is just given to, the, to us. Well, the, or not only that, not yeah, only and, that. And but women, <laughs> women are given credit for having intuition that is beautiful and desirable that is greater than men. And, uh, and it isn't the case, and men give they give deference, they give uh, homage to women. Many, many think women think that, men think that women have this intuitive insight, this motherly instinct that is, that they look up towards and worship, which is the most dangerous relationship a man could have with a woman. God help you if you look at your wife as, you, as if she was some kind of seer, you know. <laughs> Am I right, ladies? Yes. You don't want to be looked up that way and be the source of information and direction to your husbands. You'd rather be the other way around, wouldn't you? If you're married, that is. But if you're not married, you see, if you're married, you, you, a, a good woman who loves God, who is not egotistical, can see by his light. And she can see by his light that this man has this light. So she hitches his wagon, her wagon, to his star, and she becomes a helpmate, not a playmate. A hate helpmate, not a deceiver and a betrayer. Not, not supportive of what is wrong, which most women who play that role do, but a, a, but a, a helpmate to, to achieve, to help man achieve what God has in mind for him, which he, which he doesn't understand himself. She can only see his goodness, his fairness, his justice, his strength when tested. It's not found wanting. Then something in her rises to the occasion of seeing that and joins with him, joins forces with him, so that the kingdom of heaven is implemented you know, God in Christ, Christ in man, man through the woman, and of course spreading 
this consciousness of the children. But the way it is right now, everything's reversed. Man is a fallen being, prideful, fallen from the Creator. Now he thinks he's something he's not. Now there's something in a woman that teaches her to give in to her dark side. Her dark, you know, ladies, do you understand what I'm saying? There's something that talks to you inside. It's a guile, spirit in there, that teaches you to give in to your dark side, to be morbid, and then encourage men to be selfish and give in to their dark side, so that spirit will have power over all of you. Is that right? Yeah. What I wanted to say was no. that, that the creativity factor also <coughs> is a misleading f uh, force in our life because then we have these inalienable rights to uh, be God over our children. Oh, yeah. And, and that there is the di most destructive power that we're given. Destructive and we're not even aware power. that this power is Ladies, working Ladies, do you understand us. what this lady is saying? Yes. See, in other words, by, by default, man has given the power from his spirit to the woman's spirit. And, the woman, and, it, and it gives the idea of the woman she has intuition and knowing more than the man and love greater than God. And she, is that right? Yes, and, and It's that, called the liberal. If you find them as politicians, <laughs> they're called liberals. I'm an ex-liberal. <laughs> ex-liberal, thank, yes. thank you. But <laughs> in, in that realm, uh, the more children we have, the, the larger our universe expands. Yes. And the more problems we tend to create through the child to keep the universe functioning in chaos to surround us and constantly needing our Looking worship to, you for to answers, us. Yeah, to worship. Which you worry into existence. Yes. Pride. <laughs> it, it, that's pridefulness. Pride is then, that, that sort of brings that right to a nice point, that women tend to be warriors. Because they've got such a load, that the whole world is clamoring, the whole little universe that they've created, see, and destroyed, to look to her for, for answers. She has to pull out of her imagination and worry answers into existence. And of course, these are not answers at all. This is, and it gives, these answers give direction. And when they give direction, that's misdirection. It's confusion. And that is the average home. Now, this is not to demean the ladies in the audience, because I have a daughter that doesn't think I hate her. And no matter what I say about my wife, she doesn't think I hate her either. She lets me now use her, or she didn't like it, you know, because I use her as an example, because she's all women, and I'm all men. I'm a little different from all men, and she's still like most women. <laughs> she's tough. But I have hopes for her yet. If I can survive it, anybody can. Isn't it the father's fault? Pardon? I've always taken, I've always seen that whatever happens in the family, the destructive process, is not the fault of the woman. It, it, it's really... The cause of the madness springs out. It, the, she's the window through which it comes, right? The metrics. But the reason why it exists is because the man's world has collapsed. The spirit of the man, his man has fallen from his spirit. And that spirit cannot come through him to project. We're talking now about energies, forces, you know, relationships. Relationship with man and his creator. And when that is broken, than the relationship with the man and his recreator, the female. So as a man comes back to the woman for renewing, see, and not while he's being renewed, you see, he's becoming a less of a person. He lives in a state of, of euphoria. You know, when, when a man looks at a woman, I'm sure, you know, I remember how it felt like I was a kid, young man, you know, it looks like it's an entrance to paradise. It's just the opposite. It's a living hell. Because men have this pride they don't understand. This world that they want to be the king of. And they have to have the woman to reinforce the illusion. See? And that's why we're dealing with illusion. We're dealing with forces, energies, supportive energies, coming from another dimension, through the woman into the man, and to make him into an animal in his world, to affect his environment. Now, what we're going to talk about is how we're going to change our environment. We have to have a little... <coughs> A deeper understanding, like I said, Moses and Jesus, they were great people. But I'm not interested in, you know, well, I'm interested, yes, basically on Jesus saves and the blood of the Lamb and all that sort of thing. But, okay, enough of that. We need, a, that's, we need, that's the milk, now we need the meat. What 
is in the mind of these people that makes them different, that can stand up to pharaohs, that can affect their environment rather than being victims of it. Is that what you want to know? I can't give it to you just like that, you know. But at any point you can understand me, if you could hear me at any one single point, listen to this, I'm saying everything in any one thing that I say that's different, which makes it all the same. So at any point you can understand me, sounds like a lot of things I'm saying. Try to commit them to memory, don't do it. But at any point you can understand me, you have the whole of it. Like I could take one cell from my body, and, or, or a plant, it'd be, and put it in a dish. That one cell has the whole of the plant in it. The whole design. Incredible. So I can bring you back to reality. I can bring you back to the, the nucleus of your origin, and you will have everything. Not till tomorrow night, though. <laughs> okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you're enjoying the program, we're teaching a meditation process. If you'd like to get a copy of this, there's three cassettes in a book. The announcer will give you the information. If you don't have the money, we'll give it to you for whatever you can afford. That's been the policy for 27 years. And we'll join you in our next program. Part two is next. Welcome once again to the program, How to Control Your Emotions. And uh, we've been talking about, I've been talking about, they haven't been saying much, <laughs> about um, the magic which is uniquely human. Animals are not capable of much, you know, very little. They can learn only a few tricks. But human beings are capable of infinite power, magic. And I think the whole purpose of our existence is to discover that magic discover our origin. And you can't discover the magic until you discover the origin. Because we want, most of us are trying to be the origin. We're trying to play God. Look at me, everybody. I'm wonderful. And we're caught up in the adulation. And, and we punish people for not appreciating us. And we, you know, we, we love people for, you know, for appreciating us. But it's all an ego trip. And if we succeed in getting them to worship us, we are tempting them to worship the wrong God. And they're falling away from God themselves. And we are projecting a little bit of our hell into them, our identity into them. Because they become what they worship. So they can be nothing except by worshipping somebody and then being in a position to get others to worship them. Naturally, they're going to want others to worship. If you get beaten up, you're going to turn around and want to start to beat up. You take on the identity. That's why all what abusers, kids who are abused, grow up to be abusers. You become what you hate. You, you've become, become what's violated you. And it's, a, it's called pride. See? So, I'd, I have learned in my life that there is a right way of getting things. And there's a wrong way of getting things. And there's a, there, there's a right way of, of affecting the world you live in. And there's a wrong way to affect the world you live in. And the wrong way to affect the world you live in is to, to try to affect it. To try to make something happen. Because that is dangerous, because if you succeed, you'll take credit for it. And you think you've got something going for you, and you haven't. It's like going to Las Vegas. You, you win, you think, wow, and you're hooked. Then you lose, then you try to find that winning magic. And you, and you may win again. Wow, I know I knew I had it in there somewhere. And then you lose again, you get bummed out. Something says you don't have it. Well, you're not going to let anybody make you say that, tell you that you don't have it. <laughs> you're going you're to prove that you do have it. And so you put it by putting large sums. You, put, you prove your confidence by putting large sums, and you feel the excitement, and you feel by getting excited that you can affect the outcome of a dice. You, you think you, by being excited, you affect the outcome of your children's lives. You can. You make, you make them worse. Because then you affect them. And if you can affect them, so can anybody else. I have brought up children not to be affected by me or anybody else. You try to affect my kids, and you think you hit a brick wall. God help you, you try to mess with Mark. And he's only 22. I can't imagine what he's going to be when he's 42. 
If I had that start, I don't know, I think I'd be floating in space by now. <laughs> I'm just beginning, see? I'm just beginning to understand. It's a good thing I am because, you know, if I n knew any much more, maybe I wouldn't be able to talk to you. So. <laughs> That would be terrible. So I'm blessed with this little amount, and, and, it's, a, and it's enough, it's enough, because it, um, let me get back to the point. Um, all of you are creatures of your environment. All of you are, and you should not be. The Bible says man is first of spirit, first of nature. The devil made me say that. Man is first of nature, then of spirit. It also said man was first spirit than of nature because when man fell he fell to his nature his nature evolved subject to that which traumatized him to be affected by nature you're all creatures of environment and you you are affected by unseen currents emotional ones cruelty seduction people appealing to your ego your pride loving you extolling your virtues oh isn't he wonderful isn't she beautiful see isn't he clever? Or just the opposite, degrading you. Some people degrading you to, well, to force you to be great. You'll be a garbage collector if you don't, you know, get good grades at school. So some people are motivated by the insecurity, the stigma of being a garbage collector. There's nothing wrong with being a garbage collector, basically. But the point is they're motivated by fear, by insecurity to become ambitious. And we all are ambitious, and we're taught to be ambitious, and we're tricked into being ambitious. So you, so you hated being poor. So you were poor. How many people were born poor? Most of you, many of you come into a poor environment. And you hated poverty. You couldn't have bicycles like the kids down the street who lauded it over you and made you feel envious and inferior. You see, and you, you, you couldn't have the food that your cup dad came home drunk every night and you hated poverty so but I was also born poor and the difference was although I had a little bit of that rubbing off of me enough I had enough awareness to know what it eventually to see what it what it was it was my resentment which which pulled me away from the the, the riches of myself and locked me into poverty to being poor or to compensate with ambition to be rich. Who understands that? Now had, now, had you not been resentful, let's say it is poverty we're dealing with. Well, it's true with education. You feel inferior, so you get an education. But had you not been resentful, you are got to be a garbage collector. You stupid idiot. You'll never be anything. See? Or, oh, son, my son's a genius. But then again, it pulls you... If you come down to accept that idea that you're a genius, and you, there comes the ego into you, and then that, it, it, it conflicts with the, the divine ego, and you begin to feel inferior. You don't feel unworthy of, you feel unworthy of compliments, yet dependent on them. With, you can't be anything with it, but you can't be anything without it. You become worse with it, because you need that lie in order to be anything, but when you, when you act in a way to receive the praise and the the lies that you need, that you know inside our lies, it only separates you further from reality to be your own God with great guilt. Makes you afraid of accomplishing. See, so, we are often tricked into, we are all tricked, one way or the other, either people building us up or knocking us down. They build us up, you come down to accept the idea that you're something that you're not, and then you're dependent on performing for it. Now you know what kind of effect that has on you. And the more you perform, the more you're a slave of, of what it is you want from that performance, applause. And the applause, only you come down to accept the applause, but then you're, you're, it only pumps up the ego. It keeps you in the fantasy of being something you're not, yet with a terrible anxiety that something is missing and something is dying. Okay? Now, or you feel insecure because you lived in poverty and people knocked you down and this insecurity drives you to be ambitious. So, so one person wants to be a nothing because he's afraid to be a something. And one person's ambitious to be a something but he's afraid to be a nothing. But it's ambition. 
Now, come to time and space a little bit. Because uh, I could sit here and talk to you about time and space, and it's a, time is something that must be conquered. Time and space must be conquered, as you won't find eternal life. I'm saying that just, I'm pulling that out of time and space to tell you that. And then you put it aside somewhere, and maybe we'll talk about it again later on. But I'll just give you a little clue about ambition, and, and maybe you can see it. Um, in the beginning, there was timelessness. And timelessness is like the center of a wheel. It doesn't move, but somehow it's the power to make motion or to permit motion. You know, the center of the wheel is steel. Still, otherwise, look at your axle. It doesn't move it. Everything moves around it. This eye of a hurricane. It's still. Still a calm center. Cyclone. Tornado. It's still in the center, but you move away from the center and you have force. Timelessness beget time, like the eye of a hurricane. Swirling out of the nothing comes the, the, everything that everything is made of. And time is not, time is the flux. Time is a flux, but it's the, it is the, time is the first law of nature. Because it comes from timelessness, which is beyond nature. Now, we shouldn't be subject to time, but we should be subject to time, that, 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 that which made time. Somewhere within us, there's a timelessness. Somewhere within the universe, within ourselves, there's, stillness. And we have to find this stillness from which came time to become <coughs> subject to that stillness. Him who created time and everything, time, light, matter, space. We have to find that because that is what we've fallen from to be God. And we have to find that in the stillness. We have to realize we're not God and repent of being God because if we can't repent, we can't change, and He can't flow through us. He who created time and space from the very beginning cannot now co we cannot be His co-creator. We cannot re be recreated, reborn, and to be eternal beings, where su time is subject to us, because we're subject to Him that created time. But in falling away from Him who created time, we became subject to time and space and change and decay. And therefore, we're not affecting the universe for the good, although we're struggling to try and to counter-affect it, its effect on us. And we're struggling in a sea of time, moving away from our struggle, like a person sinking in a swamp. You dream you're sinking in a swamp sometimes. How many people dream they sink in a swamp? Anybody feel like they're drowning, sinking? That's it. Now, from the beginning came time, from timelessness, and time is the wind of the spirit, see, creating. And everything in this universe is everything else. Einstein made one mistake. Listen to me, downgrading Einstein. <laughs> he missed a dimension. Light, matter, time, space, light, matter being interchangeable. I say they're all interchangeable because he forgot timelessness. And he forgot that time came out of timelessness. It's a movement. It's a motion, it's an energy of some kind you can't measure. But you know it's passing you by, you feel the grind against your soul, right? And you feel yourself caught up and floating into it, away from something, right? Dying. And I'm going to come to the reason why you are dying. But out of timelessness came time, and time moving faster as it moved away from the center to the periphery, gathered great momentum and suddenly congealed into light. And light pressured by the motion from the motionless center became matter. And matter hung in space. In space, time moves past because matter is heavier than space. And so therefore, space is endless because space is, well, let's see, space is where time would have been if it was time. In other words, let's imagine a boat on the ocean, on, on the stream, anchored a piece of paper floating by the, the boat. You cut the anchor, now the boat catches up with the 
speed of the stream, which is time, but it can never catch up with a piece of paper. So the space, time flows on. So space is where, you know, the boat would have been, see, and where it is. And, but, but it's always moving faster than the boat, the stream is, so it can never, you, time is endless. You, can't, you can chase it till kingdom come and it never will. It's endless. There's no end to it, as far as we're concerned. But if you put the motor on the boat, speed up the time, speed up the boat, catch up the time, what happens to space? You're catching up to where you would have been and then there's no, then there's no time because you're catching up to its motion. But then matter disintegrates. It becomes a long stream of energy and then light and matter is no more because it cannot exist in that space without space to exist in. That's the peculiarity of matter. So, but there's no time there. As the faster you go, the slower time becomes until there isn't any more. But that's still not timelessness. There's just no time for that object. Uh, see? Now, now why have I said this? No. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you've understood it. But I've, I don't know what I said. <laughs> no. Um, why have I said that? Because of ambition. I sit here, and I, I'm here. But the minute I said, I'm going to walk over to that uh, prop man over there, Mike, it's a distance, 10 yards. The minute I say, I'm going to walk over there, time exists, space exists, and distance exists. It wouldn't have existed had I said, I'm not going to go. I'm going to New York. So I start walking to New York, and I feel, I feel time now. If I had not said I had not gone to New York, I wouldn't have felt, I just sat still in my room if I was not ambitious, and I would have felt that I was here already. It's only when you're not here and you're traveling there that you feel time, right? All right, now, so I have learned that when I drive down the highway, a strange thing happens to me. It happened a long time ago, and I didn't know what it was. I felt like the highway was driving down me. I felt I was perfectly still, and you'd like I'm in one of those amusement parlors, and, and the road is coming towards you, and I'm, you're still. And the truth of the matter is, when you find your center, you start to notice that you're outside time and space, and that these hands of yours are on a steering wheel, but they're not your hands, but you're looking through your eyes with your eyes, and that you know you're driving down the highway, and you get the odd feeling sometimes, you when you're objective outside time and space that that even, you know, even Einstein said it's not wrong for you to say that New York is coming to you. It's not wrong, and if you understand his theory, you'll see that if you go out in the space and you shoot out into space, it's not wrong because whatever, he said everything's relative. Out in the space, you could say the universe was coming to you and you were perfectly still, or you could say you're going towards the star, or the star is coming towards you. Two things moving towards each other in space, no relativity, okay? But you could say one is still. You know what it's like in space. You've seen it on the movies. Everything is still. You don't feel like you're moving at all. All of a sudden, something goes whoosh. But the other guy thinks you're doing that. <laughs> See? <laughs> Depends on your viewpoint, right? You could say that. But more so, you could say the Earth is going around the sun. But you could say the sun is going around the Earth. And it would both be true. From a physical point of view, the Earth is going around the sun. If you from a scientific view point of view, but from a metaphysical point of view, there's a paradox. If you're the center and, you, and, and you're driving down the road, but the road is driving and you found your center, the whole universe revolves around you. Take a ball, okay? Where's the center of the ball? Put your finger any place and it will be it. Correct? You who could say that wasn't the center. But anybody, some other person could also be the center too, for them. But truthfully, everybody discovers that center has discovered the same, and that's as far as I can take my analogy, the same father, the same origin within oneself. You could be any place in the universe and yet be centered in the same place because that's where all, God is omnipresent, omniscient. He's everywhere at the same time. He's where you are if you'll find him. See what I'm saying? Now, but this cannot happen if, if you're ambitious. Because the minute, you, the minute you say, I want to make a million dollars, and you set a goal, you're, see, your own ego 
trying to fulfill its pridefulness to say, ah, you see how clever I am? You drive around in your, your Mercedes or whatever it is, and you have a lot of pride in achieving this. You're moving towards this, and you're moving away from where it could be, where all things could happen through you if you're already there. You have to know that you're already there. It's only a matter of patience, not impatience, see? Not setting goals and seeking the purpose for which God had created you and say, okay, what do you want from me? So, okay, you want me to work by the sweat of my brow? Fine, I will, and do it with a good spirit. If you're a cleaning lady, make a ballerina out of it. See? And then you'll find that time passes quickly. As a matter of fact, you don't, if you're living right, you don't feel time. But if you're living wrong, you either feel like it's a grind and you want to have an amusement to pass the time because it's painful. Or you don't have enough time to achieve your goals. And when you get there, it's a failure, or if it's a success, but a success is failure too. Because you've moved away from reality. You've been attracted away from reality, and you've become part of the thing that, is, that has tempted you. It, you don't own it, it owns you. You never own anything. It owns you when it tempts you to move toward it. Because you're moving away, away from the very spirit that could protect you from whatever it is behind the object that's teasing you. Who understands that? Good. Hear that? So, they're lying to you. My friends, they're lying to you when they say you should set goals. Because I have, have everything in my life, and I'm where I'm sitting right here, because I didn't set a goal. I didn't know I was going to sit here. I knew I had some purpose, all right? I didn't know what it was. So all I did, I didn't know how I knew this. As a matter of fact, it's hard to articulate. And it seems to be coming across now to me to express to you. But I had this because I had the kernel, the nucleus of that spirit, which knows things without knowing why it knows, without having to intellectualize everything. It just, it's a happening. I have a relationship with my father not as a higher relationship as the Father that Jesus had, or Moses, but nevertheless, a relationship. And that everything in this world is relationships. Your relationship with your Creator determines, or lack of one, determines your relationship with your wife, with people, places, things, objects. Do you become a slave? Do you own them, or do they own you? Do you have a positive influence on your family? Or do they have a negative influence on you? See? Are you moving away from reality, trying to be a reality? Setting up a wrong relationship? Setting up wrong waves in the world? Being infected by wrong energies? Forces you cannot see because you've lost the illumination to see with? I've done all the talking this evening, haven't I? <laughs> I shouldn't have done it. But anyway, my, my producer's going to spank me afterwards. But you see the point. Is that these points have to be made. You do not set goals, but live every moment wisely. Even when you're eating food, simple like eating food or spending money. Is your is spending your money or is your money spending you? See? Uh, when you're eating food, why do you eat something you're sh not supposed to eat? Why? You know, I should eat it, but here goes. Mmm, so delicious. Heaven <laughs> heavenly. Why do you do that? It's as simple as that. Why is that? Because whenever you do something that you know is wrong, so you know it's what's right, but you don't listen to it. You do what makes you feel good, God. See, it makes you feel heavenly. The devil's food cake it becomes an angel's food cake, see. <laughs> see? It doesn't make you feel like a devil, it makes you feel like an angel. It's the devil that made you feel like the angel, see. So, but you're doing what you know is wrong. You're, be, you're, you're, you're mingling, you're co-mingling with the spirit, and your character is being forged and weakened. That's why it's dangerous to not to give in to your impulses. But the forces in this world are teaching you to give in to the impulses because without you, the evil on this earth 
cannot manifest itself. It's, it's, it's used a borrowed form. You know, God creates, the devil can only destroy. It has to recreate, you, you know, reform you, rearrange you in some way so it can make a home for it to live through or make you a, a vehicle full of, it, of its expression, a conduit for its hell. And you're experiencing all that, and that's all because of, and, there, and all of these things are being taught in the churches in positive thinking, and glorify the, the, the relationships that exist between men and women. It's all glorified. Creative, creativity is being taught in cockamamie ways. See? And, there, and, and because the wrong people, the Baptists have got in the belfry, and I'm telling you it's all lies. Do you believe me? Do you? Good. Because when you believe me, you can, you can start doubting the insanity of the world and work quietly and diligently and, and save your money, and save your essence, save your energies. Don't co commingle with the wrong kinds of people, and don't give, even a nickel when you turn it over and don't spend it. You go into a store to buy a shirt, maybe you don't need one. Learn to conserve, learn to go without, not because you're, you know, you're um, some saint denying yourself, not that, but just, just be wise, and, and you get rewarded to, by the Spirit to be wiser and you to resist temptation more so. So that eventually you become the child of that light and you start to receive powers, not for several years. Don't think you're going to get, that you do what I tell you, that you don't, you, you, you go to a store and, and you don't buy a candy bar, that you think you can walk on water tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> it has to form. You've got to be patient and know that that's the future for you. But meanwhile, you get marvelous benefits of being a happy person. You won't live in hell. Your children will start to respect you. E things start to go easier for you because they see you start to flow into them and they start to flow into you respectfully without will or force. Tomorrow we'll continue with a similar subject and I won't talk as much tomorrow and, uh, and uh, the producer's doing this. He says, send money. Otherwise we can't. We need your flow. God doesn't make money up there. We the Treasury makes it, you earn it, and we need it to pay the bills. So pre please support the program. If you don't, this unique program won't be on the air. If you feel like you're enlightened and lifted by it, do it for yourself and do it for others yet to experience this kind of thing. The material is available. Please stay tuned. Uh, how to get this identity in, in this relationship is available, and the announcer will give you the information and we'll talk it to you tomorrow night. Part three is next following this brief message. The preceding lecture was produced by the Foundation of Human Understanding. For more information, write to the Foundation of Human Understanding at P.O. Box 1009, Grants Pass, Oregon, 97526, or call 1-800-877-3227. Thank you. once again to the program, How to Control Your Emotions, and uh, just a recap from our last discussion. I was talking about ambition. When you set a goal, you move away from yourself, and then you become a slave of the thing that has beckoned you to fall to it. And an unhealthy relationship exists between you and objects, people, places, and things, especially those people who support you in your ambitions and goals. So everything really is relationships, relatives. If you're relation, you have a good relationship with God, whoever that is. See, most of us don't know where to find God, but the very fact that we have not found Him alters our relationships with people, places, and things. So instead of a, we, you, me, and Daddy, Big Daddy, Big Daddy. <laughs> affecting the world creatively, creating a kingdom of heaven, that relationship being non-existent, it's like the earth, um, the moon going around the earth and held by its gravitational pull. It can never get free. The moon has a relationship with the earth and it affects the tides and the mating of the fishes and God knows what. It can never be free. It has a relationship. 
But if another heavenly body would sweep by that moon with a stronger gravitational pull, then off goes the moon into that orbit, and bingo, Earth has no moon. Now the moon is now trailing behind this other object. Now that's a relationship. Now one has been robbed and violated, and it's the same thing with your own life. We have a heavenly something that created us, and we are orbiting in a manner of speaking. Up pops an imposter with some power, uh, uh, an earthy power, and pulls us away into a relationship with it. So we now have we're cut off from it, our power to deal with it. I've often said you can, you can um, rebel against God, but you can't free yourself from the devil, no matter how much you fight. Now you're on this earth, and you're struggling with the fact that it affects you. People affect you. People who know how to, people who know how to, in whom the original nucleus dwells, the original temptation, the master of the arts of removing, revolving you, being the center of your orbit, and living through you. Because there's, any, there's a connection there, a relationship, and they're the center of that relationship, and you're focused in on them. You're focused in on teacher, the teacher can put things into your mind. If you don't pay attention, they cannot. I want to defocus you. You're focused in. The, the kingdom of hell, and hell is pouring into your mind, and you're acting it out, and you can't help yourself, you can't stop yourself. Everything is bad luck for you, even good luck. God help you if you wish for things and you get it. You won't be happy with it. You know it, don't you? Now, that is the a capping of our last discussion. Who has comments, inquiries, who wishes for me to continue a line of thought? Okay. We'll, okay, I'm glad we have some hands going up because my producer hates me for me to sit here and be a talking head. Yes, um, I was wondering, you said in your last show about um, giving up goals. And I've spent the last couple of years going to night school just for that very reason. I don't know how to, I felt if I didn't do it, I, would, I wouldn't exist. I, would be, I, I didn't say you couldn't be an engineer. Because being an engineer could be what you're interested in. That is what, you, what is revealed to you to be interested in, for you to do at hand now. Just keep being interested in doing it what's hand now, it becomes something else. But don't set goals. You know, don't exceed your grasp. Try to understand the meaning of what I'm saying without me sort of f falling over my own words. Don't let your reach exceed your grasp because you're going to fall. Just do what... How I've done mine through life is just do what I love to do. I just, I, I don't do what I loathe to do. And when I was in school, you couldn't make me do anything I didn't want to do. You couldn't make me learn, you couldn't make me study, because I wouldn't go around that orbit. I wouldn't orbit around somebody else's will. I felt it as a violation of my soul. I felt religion was the same thing. When I went to synagogue, I laughed my head off. <laughs> I went to synagogue for laughs. Because I couldn't believe that grown-up men thought that muttering under their breath was worship. You Catholics know what I'm talking about too, don't you? That's like, that's like a synagogue, isn't it? So, it's, it's all of it. it. They don't understand what worship is. So, um, no, if you're centered, and you, you, like Jesus said, he said, seek first the kingdom of God, and it's within you. He said where it was. Be still and know it that I am God and you are not. See? And then you'll know my purpose. Seek first that which is me, my purpose on earth. See? Seek to know me and then all other things will come about. But you seek the things to come about first. Because then if you can make them come about, you can crow about it as if you were God. Now, I'm saying just do what is just natural for you to do. Do what you love. Don't let anybody stop you. People hate that bright, um, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed little kid running through the 
grass, free, carefree. They hate that. They've been robbed of that themselves. Don't let those old crusty swine ruin your life. See? What I'm hearing you say is that as long as it's in the proper perspective, yeah, that you will know that. Yeah. So you will. You could. You already know that's in the proper perspective. Then it's okay to pursue a goal. Look, I was interested in hypnotism when I was a young fellow. Everybody says, look at Roy Masters, hypnotism, hypnotism. Really. <laughs> you know, well, can you hypnotize me? I said, when are you going to wake up? <laughs> Already hypnotized. <laughs> yeah. But our point is, made fun of me. They made fun of me. But I kept ahead being interested in it because I thought it was good. Mathematics wasn't interesting to me. A lot of other things weren't interesting mm -hmm. to me. But that was, so I did it. And I did it so it led to something else. And I did the something else that led to something else. So, um, and each one led to its own discovery, its own chain of events, which is unfolding from within and not any deciding, I'm going to be a doctor. See? I'm not going to be anything. I'm just going to be whatever uh, the spirit within me shows me what to be interested in. It also shows me what to remember. For instance, my teacher says now, I want you to remember this French poem. I said, to hell with you. <laughs> I went to a boarding school, you know, with strict English teachers. And so he, I wouldn't learn that French poem. He says, well, I, and I, he chased me around the, he wanted to hit me with a cane. <laughs> he chased me around the, around the study. I said, I'm not gonna learn it. He says, good for your mind. I said, I'll decide what's good for my mind. That is junk. See, I, you let your children decide because what is in the child is more than is in the teacher who wants to impart to the child. The teacher what should draw out from the child. That's what ed education is, educare. Come, it, it means to bring forth from within, not to slap on like a coat of paint. So follow and encourage your children to follow the <coughs> natural flow of things because it, it's from God and leads to God and leads to heavenly results, happiness, the kingdom of heaven on earth. The system you're born into is totally corrupt and bankrupt. Okay? Uh, Roy, I had a question for you. My question is this. Uh, you're so when... told you can sit down. <laughs> All right. Um, when Lucifer first manifest himself. Uh oh, I don't know anything about those things. Well, maybe I, we're getting out of our depth here, but not too metaphysical, I hope. <clears throat> when, when Satan polarized against God and decided that he wanted to take things his way, was that his failing and his falling to the... Tough one. To pri for, of, yes, it is. Of pride. Uh, By the same, same reason why Satan fell, we also fall to Satan. He's also pride and he encourages us to be prideful. As I said before, with women, I said all women have something in them that makes them give in to it. It's called a spirit of doubt. And that women tend to be very negative and confusing. Ladies, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but... But then you tend, that quality in a woman's spirit is very supportive of the same quality in a man. He, she encourages a man to give in to his flesh. And she awakens the flesh in him to give in to. And they both give in to Satan. And he makes a home through the woman into the man, and the children get it. There's a wrong order, hierarchy of things. And that, that system has been carefully preserved on this earth, and that's why there's wars and sickness and disease. There should be, by all means, when I was a little boy, you know, I saw people coming in out of the fog and going into the, out of the fog and into the fog, out of, this, out of my home window. And I could see that something's wrong. That's what life, people come out of the fog and into the fog, and that's their life. It was very, very traumatic for me because suddenly I got to realize this is what life is all about. You come out into life, you're born and you die, and you don't know, it's, a, it's one big fog, meaningless. But it doesn't have to be that way. The whole system is set up because you're all victims. Somebody has to get through and say, knock it off, right? You don't have to listen to the experts. They're all stupid. Didn't you know that when you were a kid? Don't you know that they're then, that way now? You know, just, just recently, this, the freeway shootings, right? Now, who is it? Wants to take all the, make sure 
pass new laws so no one has to shoot, can shoot guns at, well, there's already laws to do for that. <laughs> <laughs> They're really doing something. They don't ask why are people doing that, because they don't know why, and they don't want to know why. They just want to have more power. They don't mind the wrong, they just look for a new opportunity to take your guns away. They're going to take, they're, well, we're now we're going to make laws that everybody who carries a gun in their car is going to get two years sentence, mandatory. But the other guys, they forget that the people who carry the guns in their car are going to carry them in there anyway. And the only people that are going to get punished are you for protecting yourself. They're insane, those people. Can't you see that they're insane? They come up with the wrong, wrong solutions. But they don't, but with the same token, if that's what they're going to do that, why don't they take alcohol away from everybody? They've got the power to take every alcohol away from it because they're killing people right and left with it. Cigarettes, they don't stop you from smoking. They don't let you advertise, maybe. They even, uh, they even what do they call it, to subsidize those poisons. It's insane. There's something gone wrong with the human race, you see, and we're going to have to solve our own problems. But we have to get back to the, to the solution because we're part of the problem. We get look to human agencies for answers. And nobody, nobody on this earth, on the other side of earth, which is hell, can ans your pro answer your problems. They cannot. Don't look for them. Don't look for love. Don't look for appreciation. Don't look for health. Don't look for happiness. You know, minimal. So you, you break your leg so you have someone who knows a little bit what they're doing to put it back. You don't ask a carpenter to do, do it, unless he's Jesus. <laughs> See what I mean? But there's a certain skills that people have you acknowledge, but you know, it's a surface. Your real problems come from not having a right relationship within and then all other relationships being wrong. And you being affected by those other wrong people, and you affecting wrong people, and the wrong people affecting you, it's one big, complicated, hopeless mess. Now, the, uh, the first thing, as I said in my last program with you, is that you've got to learn, listen, you've got to learn not to be affected that you don't, no, there's no need to affect. If you are affecting people, trying to will yourself, make things happen, is because you are a victim of other people making things happen to you. You're a victim of your environment, it means you're not subject to God. That means you are extension of some kind of hell that's living through them, a slave of it, and therefore trying hard to make them a slave or being a king on a bigger, smaller mountain with somebody else looking up at you and responding to you. No, you have to learn the dignity of not being affected. To stand in the midst of chaos like Ollie North, unflinching. You can only do that when you don't care about what happens. What you, you don't care about your house. You don't care about your home. You don't care what people think of you. Yes, you care about your children. That's why you're standing up. Because you want them to see that you stand for something that isn't material that material things are not more important than what you know is right in your heart. There's always an issue like that somewhere along the line which you can stand for, first in a smaller degree and then in a greater degree. I'm sure Ollie North had little things he stood up for. Then he had to stand up to the whole Congress and all the powers that be that could put him in jail and ruin his life, the media as well, and he wiped the floor with them. That's because he wasn't affected. But see how calm he was? What did you... Didn't you, weren't you moved by the fact that he was calm? Weren't you inspired to see that he wasn't moved by the world around him and not intimidated? That he affected things by not being affected by people and things? That's what you were inspired by. I'm not sure, sure I can do as good. He made me feel ashamed of the fact that I, could, I can't, I couldn't stand You can't even stand up to a flea. <laughs> right. You even get bothered by the fleas in the carpet. Yes. <laughs> oh, you can get angry with the fleas. Yes. The, the, the cat trips over you, or you trip over the cat, <laughs> and it bothers you. Your whole lot, you, it wrecked your whole day. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. No, knock that off. You've got to start looking at this. The one emotion I'm talking about is resentment, because that sets you up to be pressurized. The resentment is pride, judgment. And that makes you your own God. That brings you in opposition to God. 
and that makes you subject to the thing that tempts you and then you find yourself pressured by everything because the very existence in your relationship with people places and things and as a fallen being is pressure people watching television will feel like I they call up that they call up the station and say get this Roy Masters off the air you know who is he to say this and who is he to do it they feel like I'm pushing my will on them I'm not it's because they've resented me suddenly they feel pressure so they feel the pressure to do what I want them to do and they, and they can't even turn the radio off they have to call the station to get me off the air <laughs> <laughs> It's the only way they get relief. Because tomorrow night they're going to be watching again. They have to have somebody else take them away from the pressure. Save me from Roy Masters. <laughs> yes. Uh, I wanted to touch briefly on what you said, all things relative on ambition. I wasn't aware that I was ambitious in any way until tonight. Good. And I realized as a child, I had set a goal without any awareness that I had set a goal. All right. I had resented my mother uh, when my father would get on, put on strike, when the company would go on strike. Right. She would cut back the food, never for herself or my dad, but for the kids. And my brother and I would sneak down the kitchen at night steal it. and steal food. And this resentment said to me, you know, I'm... I'm never going to be without, be without food. food again. I'm going to find somebody See, that's that, going that, to that stock just, me with that food. That decided the course of your whole life, That's didn't right. It, it did. Uh, who, anybody else ha here have... Uh, let's hear your ambitions. Let's, let's hear... Uh, uh, you finished with that idea? Uh, yeah. I just wanted to say that that led into my present state, that it doesn't make... It's not money. It's the food is the power. That's my riches right there. That's your there. riches and that's and your goal. And it doesn't make any difference what kind of food, as long as that food's there when I want to go. Are you awake to that now? It yeah, have I am awake to it. Does it have the power as, as it once did now? It, no, it, it's, lo it's lost a lot of power tonight just through realizing where the came. But if you allow the realization comes in, it pulls you back into an orbit and pulls you away from the power of the other orbit. You yeah, see that? I understand that. The light's coming in. I mean, you realize that food, or whatever it is, has a power of you, and you're am all of your objects of ambitions where you compensate for whatever it is that's missing, okay? Yeah. They have a tremendous force, a gravity. It's like a gravity. And you, so it, you have all your will to struggle against it, and then it, you give it power. It seems like you give it power by trying to stop yourself. It's like driving with the brakes on, right? Now, just think of it. Something as simple as, hey, I see what sin, resentment is a sin, resent your parents, your parents tempted you by being selfish, right? Mm -hmm. And not thoughtful. That was the other, that's the other dimension coming through that make you hate secretly. And this secret resentment uh, um, creating a trauma. It wasn't the hunger. It wasn't the was, hunger, it was, it was a their hunger. selfishness. And insecurity. I didn't, yeah. To have more food to be to, secure. To know that they were not hungry at all and to know that I resented them for making me feel hungry. Now, can you forgive them? Yes, I can. Because but they couldn't I help themselves either because yeah, someone laid a trip on them that made them oh, that yeah, way. Oh, yeah, they went through the depression. They started. Well, they went that way themselves. Yeah. yeah. Someone laid some strange trip on them, and it came out in that form to you. And mm -hmm. this is your form. See? Anybody else have an ambition that has led them away from reality that they were tricked into having? Anybody wants to talk about it? Yeah, here's another lady in front here. Um, mine has been to work myself to death. <laughs> You know, and for I security? Think, uh, yeah, it's been insecurity. For, for yeah. approval? Not necessarily for approval. It's like um, abandonment. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always been afraid of being abandoned. And? You know, like my mother, she, you know, sh she's, she did things that would cause me to, you know, not, not be able to cling on her. And I felt all alone, like, what am I going to do now? I'm alone and I couldn't depend but upon But you must have mother. tempted you to cling and then rejected you. Or rejected you and then tempted you to want what you couldn't have. Yeah, how, did well, it that too. how did it come about? You have to look at the, do you remember the initial, was it an initial experience or was it many little things that added up to? Well, it's been many little things, that's why it's so confusing. What kind of woman was your mother? Then just look at this quickly. Well, she was a hard working mother. And? She, she did work hard and I know she tried to do. And you work hard. Yeah, I try to work hard and it's always like. Because um, there's something of your mother. I in work there. harder than my husband, let me put it that way. I work harder than him, and 
you know, like he won't be making any money. And I. Well, where's the ambition? Well, I, it's because my mother. Okay, the ambition is is that. See, she saw I'll something clearly. Go out and she saw it overdo clearly. him. You know what I mean? Oh, or to outdo like that. him. It's like I'm trying to outdo him. I mean, because he he'll he just. He'd turn me off because he just sits there, you know, and watches well, TV. Well, that's not quite and, the same thing. That's really... And I have this inner ambition to get out there and do it. Yeah, well, that's, you know, yeah, but that's not quite what we're talking about, although I mm -hmm. will talk about it since you brought it up. Yeah. That is, um, that is um, this natural way of a woman for to be superior and to be contemptuous of men. And you, you found a man who is that way mm -hmm. that you can resent. You see, you go, in other words, you're irritable with someone inferior to you. So you yeah. Was your father that way? No, he did work, but... But your mother was harder work. But working. my mother was that way. Your mother was him. more prideful. She and wanted more, she more and more energy. And more. She had more and more energy yeah. than your father. Well, see, have you ever seen... Uh, um, have you ever been impatient with a person when someone doesn't do something very well and they're fumbling and you get impatient and then you get the energy to do it for them? Yeah. See? I, I well, that's how a, woman, that. a woman tends to be that way with her husband, trying, and she likes to be the busy one. Yeah. She likes him to fumble and fail to come to his rescue so she can look like she is the Yeah, that's what I do. As a matter of fact, I, I, I see it now because I do it with my kids. I'll, I'll tell my kids, you do it this way and that way, you know, the dishes or something like that. Well, I'll be darned. I'll look at those dishes and they still have spots, you know, or, or but, but you set them <laughs> something, up, but you, you know. Set them up, you set them up to do yeah. things wrong. So you can come to the rescue. So it's a pride thing of yours. Yeah, you get like you, you want to look more energetic, m more yeah. brighter than that's your family. That's why I say I, I work myself to death yeah. doing that. You know. Yes. Well, I'm also quite sure that that's no. really the same thing. Feels like ambition. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is a sort of ambition. You know. Does anybody else have one? The lady just now had a nice, clear point of the fear of poverty, and the fear of yes, the gentleman mm -hmm. back there. Yeah, a lot of times, or all my life, I've kind of grown up with this image of this beautiful woman that I'm going to marry someday. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I find my relationships with women very shallow, be and I'm really not sure why. It's like I need to, it's like I have no, an unnamed... That's not a good one. No, that's not a good one. That's not a good one? Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and no, I'm looking for something very specific. I, very specific. I, I hope that that lady that just stood up a few minutes ago, we're really triggered. I saw a lot of people you know, breathing in rather rapidly saying, yeah, identify with that, but then everybody sort of sh shut up all of a sudden, clammed up. It's like you have an unhappy home, and then you make up your mind as a woman that you're not going to have an unhappy home. See, you hated your mother, you're going to be unlike your mother, and you're going to have a happy home, and then you, you try to hold the marriage together where it shouldn't be together, and that's the ambition, right? And then you find that the more you try to keep the marriage together, the worse it becomes, the worse it becomes, the more you panic. Because it's you, you, your 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 determination, your prediction, what you said would happen is wouldn't happen. Would happen isn't happening. Or the other way around, you 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 said I'm not going to have an unhappy home, and you're having an unhappy home, and it terrifies you. And you work harder and harder to hold a marriage together. See, that's all because of resentment. And then and then having a good marriage is the is the is the stick, and you're the donkey. And you're moving slowly away from. From, your, from the real answers to become involved with a very big problem. Follow that? So if ha that hadn't happened, your whole life wouldn't have been, would have been different. You made all these different terms differently. Your relationships would have been different. Don't you see? You know, you, you turn left, you turn right, you save your money or you spend your money. You go to Las Vegas or you don't. You make a good investment or you, eat, eat a, eat, you take girls out to dinner and make an impression and buy new cars you don't need. You're making different turns different kind of name and uh, uh, character is forming. A different future is taking sh shape. See, magic. Something is flowing through, something is entering, and then something is being closed off. Right? Well, I enjoyed it, and I uh, hope I'll get some more, get you, you, you um, responding a little better in our next uh, discussion tomorrow. And you should listen to me on radio in uh, Los Angeles. 8.70 on the dial, 9 o'clock in the morning, and, of course, every night on the station, Monday through Friday. And we need gelt. And you know what gelt is, is money. <laughs> if we don't have the money, we can't keep the program on the air. So initially, if you just get the materials, which will be flashed on the screen in a moment, to teach you how to meditate and flow from within and not to be affected by your environment so you can affect environment. 
we'll join you in the next program. Control your emotions and just to cap off what we were talking about last time is that basically we must not be affected by things and uh, the evidence that you're not affected by people, places and things, not tempted in other words, is that you have found something greater than the world within you that tempts you. What is in me is greater than is in thee. And what is in thee, the power of what is greater than in, in me, is growing greater and stronger, affecting me not to be affected by you. And if I'm not affected by you, I will affect you. Your first law is learn not to be affected by your children, your husband, and this, we must be very specific in a minute, but generally speaking, you must not respond with, to temptation. And you have to know in your, in your mind of minds, in your bone of bones, what those temptations are. And if you love the truth, you won't have to give anyone give you a moral code. You'll know it in your heart. And if you don't know it, you'll experience pain. So if you don't know it from understanding, you'll learn it from pain. And pain will bring you back scurrying for the instructions. How do I get back to reality again, right? See? So there's two ways to learn it. You can either hear it in the beginning or get it in the end. <laughs> and if you get it in the end, you come back to the beginning or you'll keep going right down to a hole in the floor. It's a big dark hole, there's no end to that. The fact that you are unmoved by the world around you, like an Ollie North, means you have found something you can live for and die for. If you haven't got that, I mean, the alcoholics will die for their alcohol. The, dr the drug addicts will die for their drugs. We all die for the strangest things. Whatever fixes us, whatever saves us from ourselves, what helps us to deny reality, helps us to be that reality, keeps the grand lie going in our head, our big fat egos going. Those forces are there with their fixes and their supports and with their supportive love, the, lo the love that is a lie, the lie that we love. Now, the whole world is, is living in a state of denial. Teachers, parents deny, alcoholics deny, children deny when they're wrong, alcoholics won't see that they're alcoholics. Everybody's denying. Politicians deny. And there's always people helping you to deny. Even, even that morsel of food when you know you shouldn't eat it. What are you doing when you're eating that morsel of food? You're renewing the ancient contract. You know you shouldn't eat it but you eat it anyway. You have a conscience, you know you shouldn't. But people say, come on, just one more bite. It's delicious. <laughs> right? You oh, okay. <laughs> and they're just saying, you know, instead of saying, no, thank you. But they won't love you. You won't get your reassurance for who you are. Out will pop that reality that they, they themselves are afraid to face. See what I'm saying? And so you're different. But why do you take that morsel of food? It's because you're rebelling against reality. Just like the first forbidden food helped man, like peyote, to rebel against reality. Then we have all these things in this world to lock us in so that never come back to reality. To, because if we ever come back to reality, you see what a disheveled mess we are. What a decadent civilization, what a decadent being, what a, what a wasted life that we're not gods but dogs. We want to see ourselves in a good life, that light we have to have lies. We've got to be fixated, focused in, focused away from reality, focused in on the unreality, and it's the unreality that's becoming reality in our own lives. It's called hell. Death and dying, disease and suffering and war. Now, okay, now, we're going to... That's heavy stuff, right? You can get off the floor now. <laughs> question about the meditation. Yes, a little louder, please. Um, I have a really tough time dealing with some of my realizations that I'm getting from the meditation and talking about sorry. hell. And I'm seeing it, and I don't, I panic. Don't it's panic. very frightening. Don't panic. I mean, I it's feel my heart what, what? beating right now. 
because I have that reality shining in me. It's frightened. But me. it's not you that's frightened, is it? Or I is feel it, it, frightened. Pardon? I feel frightened at the things that I've but become is it aware you? of. Is, now look at, you, look at yourself. Do you love reality? Do you lo aren't yes, you searching I do. For, aren't I you searching for something better than what you have now? Aren't you searching for the purpose of your creation, the reason for your existence? Well, that's what you're coming to. The meditation is bringing you to that root between two worlds, the root of matter, where matter comes to, to a point where it just roots, where somehow you're standing somewhere poised between the, the world of the invisible world, the intangible world that created the tangible world, and the tangible world. And if you could, if you could come right to the roots of matter, like if you could get to the at atom, the scientists are trying to, you know, get to the smaller and smaller and smaller particles because they figure the smaller the particle, the more they can affect everything else above it, right? It's the same with you, but in a much more real state, you have to come closer and closer down the roots where matter and time and timelessness meet, and it's a sort of a no man's land there, sort of stillness, where there can be a new creation, a new creating, and a new creature. I've been feeling that no man's land. I just, I, I worry about being able to deal with it because I feel What do you it. mean dealing with it? It's going to deal with you. <laughs> You've never been able to deal with unreality, let alone reality. <laughs> just sit there and realize and feel pain and okay. anxiety and guilt. Just feel it. Don't run from it. You've been running from that all your life. I'm teaching you to come toward it. And if you come towards it, there's going to be great anxiety. The two anxieties you will feel. One, coming toward it, because let's give you an example. Let's say you did something naughty and you ran away from home, you stole. So you run away from home. Why do you run away from home? Because you don't want to be punished. You don't want to be found out. You don't want to be guilty. So you run around with the bad guys, and they like you the way you are. But then in order to get their love, you have to do for them what they want you to do, so which makes you even more guilty which makes you even more afraid to come home to daddy. One day you find yourself in a pigsty, eating with the pigs, and you figure, well, how did I get here? I was better off at home. Maybe I shouldn't have stolen that. Maybe I've got to go back and dad and tell him. But see, there's two anxieties. One, when you do wrong, and you, you know that you did wrong because daddy's back there, and you, you know someday you have to come back to him, but you're trying to delay it, see? So you feel anxiety because you did more wrong in rebellion. But now, on the way back, you feel anxiety. See? There's two different anxiety. One is not resolvable. One or anxiety, if you run away from the guilt into doing more bad things, <coughs> then you feel better for a while, but then worse afterwards. And then you do more wrong things, and you feel better for a while, escaping, but then you feel worse afterwards. Anxiety. And when you come back to reality, you start feeling worse right away. You start saying, oh, well, I better face the music. And as you walk towards your daddy's house, it gets, the pain gets a little greater. And then you knock on the door, and you feel like it's going to give you a blast. And instead of he, he says, my son, you know, he was dead, and now he's alive, right? So he doesn't condemn you at all. All he wanted you is to come back. See? It's in your imagination, the anxiety and the fear that he's a punishing father, and you feel the terror of the guilt. You're only judging God by your own standards. You know how, if someone stole from you, how you feel towards them, you want to knock their head off. <laughs> See? He's not that way. See? So, come towards, and what will happen if you sit quietly and feel the pain, anxiety, just experience it. Because there's only two ways you can go. There's, there's either mo motion away from reality, and if there's no emotion away from reality, reality catches up. So be still and know God. No reality, and a pain catches up with you because if you're not moving away, you're moving towards. You can't help it. Because the, the truth is ever present. If you just stop still, it's there. And the more you stop still, the closer you get to it. The closer you are to being still, the closer you are to reality. And now you start to feel the anxiety, and that's, you know, what it is. You're coming back to God. <coughs> it's a language. You have to learn the language. This language, after you break through that cycle, it starts to talk to you in revelation. 
you understand things without knowing why you understand them. And you believe, and you don't know why you believe them, mm -hmm. and nobody can shake that belief. And it becomes real in your life. But sit still, and all of a sudden, the anxiety will become great, your heart may beat, all of a sudden your, your, your body will start to feel warm and glowing, like you might even feel now. Anybody feeling any of that now, some of that? Some of you already, can't you see? Because you're experiencing a meditation as I'm talking. And all of a sudden you feel, hey, it's not so bad. Like, like Daddy said, it's okay. All I wanted you to do was come home. And you, the lesser, every time you sit still, there are lesser guilts that you've had that you start to relive, feel anxiety about, but just quietly gets worse before it gets better, but don't panic. Okay? Yeah. You were asking in uh, last night's show about uh, ambitions, and it tie my question ties in real well with what you were saying because um, I developed an ambition about knowledge, and even though I've quit trying to feed the knowledge, it keeps you know coming out and coming out, and I still keep living in it. Uh, explain yourself a little bit. I know you, you mean intellectual knowledge, right? Feeling insecure, like you did, you're stupid, and you had to be smart. And if you had more knowledge, maybe you'd be. That would be the answer. No, I don't feel like I need it anymore, but it's really difficult for me to keep my mouth shut, you know, when, when I hear something needs to be corrected or I just, or just... Well, I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, that sounds like me. <laughs> 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 well, I, the only reason why I... Naturally, I don't see anything wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, the only reason why I, why I feel like there might be something wrong with it is because... It All right. seems like no matter how much I, I try to relax and let go of the ambition that, you know, the alligators are still nipping at my keister. I, I can't seem to, to get down to draining the What part the is your keister? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I don't seem to... I don't I'm seem not quite sure I understand what you're saying, though. I don't Anybody else understand what he's saying? Yeah. You'd have to get that by some kind of internal oh, man, I uh, satellite. <laughs> So, I, somehow I don't, I don't feel like, like I'm still working my life right. Um, well, you're probably not. Yeah. But the, but the reality of seeing that you're not working your life right is working your life right. Because most people work, are not working their life right, but they don't see that they're working their li life right. Or if they see that it's working, they're not working their life right, they hate seeing it, or they roll up their sleeves and fix it themselves. And it's a vicious cycle because you can't make your life go right by that either. <coughs> In other words, the beauty, eventually, doing nothing, now you have to be careful how I say this to interpret what I mean. The less you do, more happens. Because you're acting as a, a, a conduit for what is happening, like an electrical force. And of course, it moves you, it animates your arms and legs and your speech and your decision-making processes. But a, a little turn to the left, a little turn to the right, a little adjustment here with wisdom. Let's say you want to fix your TV set. So you don't know anything about it. You know, then the principles, the TV, you're in the middle of a good program you're watching, now the television goes out, so you get a screwdriver, you take the back, you get electric shock right away. <laughs> right? <laughs> You start to fix it, and you pull the tubes out, now you forget how to put it back together. <laughs> Hours later, you get so mad, you hit it with a hammer and smash the whole thing, go out and buy a new one. <laughs> well, the thing is, if you knew what you were doing, you may have found that it was a loose wire. A little to the right, a little, and your life would have been so much better, you could have watched the show. And uh, now, wouldn't it be nice if you could just see where your loose screws are? <laughs> <laughs> see? It's just a matter, if just adjust here, a little adjustment there, and the light of reality will show you exactly where to adjust, where to turn right and to let, and then your life gets so easy. Some people are planting the corn, you know, when it's harvest time. They're planting the corn, but they're planting it at the wrong time. Some people are going in to buy gold and other people are rushing in to sell it. Somehow they got their timing off. And we need to talk about timing too. Timing, I, timing is coming from the right place. I can tell when people are not coming from the right place. I can tell when people are not coming from the right place because even if they have the right words and they are perfect movie actors, from my timing, where I am, I can see that their timing is off. See, it's not saying it and doing it 
in the time I would say it and do it. I know I can tell it. You can see where I'm coming from? See, I'm not contriving anything. You see where I'm coming from? You, because you have a perception. Because you're actually coming from or going to the same place. Therefore, you have the insight. You know it takes one to know one. See? You know where I'm coming from. But I can also people know when they're not one of mine. See? And they can't fool me. And they've got to get up early in the morning because I have that reality they don't have. And they can imitate it, but they can't duplicate the timing. I can also see people trying to affect me. Have you ever felt people sending out radar signals, scanning, your, scanning you for weaknesses? You can almost feel them bouncing energy off of you. You feel little feelings some, sometimes in the solar plexus. And something inside you is warning that something's wrong. Now, good people don't send out feelings like that because the, the, the bad people sending out energy signals to see where there's weakness. And where there's weakness, that signal goes through and you become influenced. It, fi it, it finds a chink in your armor. It gets right through. But good people are not trying to influence you. You come into my office, I'm not after your money. You go into Reverend Shuler's office, guess what? <laughs> Can't you see him smiling and... <laughs> Can you see him? Just take one look at that face. And you see where he's coming from? Now, because those guys think I'm coming from the wrong place. Because right is wrong to them. Uh, uh, you know, real is phony and phony is real. We watch for it. We don't like each other very much. Okay? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, it might have something to do with ambition, but I'm not sure. Uh, first, we're supposed to seek the key uh, to seek the kingdom of righteousness. Yes. And then everything else will be added out to us. Yeah, the right way. So, the meaning: seek first the kingdom of the right way. The right way is to work. And, and to listen to your conscience and to never be thrown off course by the winds and pressures and stresses and temptations of life, to hold fast to your roots until the storm goes by and not to be dashed on the rocks or caught up in whirlwinds and whirlpools. This is very important. It does not seem to give reward right away. It not, you, maybe when you get older and when you fi suddenly find that you have this power, you know, when you're living in hell and you've got boils and, ca and cancers and <coughs> all things wrong with you and, and, and you plug into this reality and for the first time, you know, it sweeps over you. That's the place to be and that's this discovery realizes itself into your and breathes life into your being. You know, it's a tremendous relief, like a person drowning or uh, parched in a desert. A cup of water is a lot to him. But you see, in the very beginning, when you're, if you're young, um, you can make a lot of mistakes and not notice it right away. You, you, your, your soul is whittled away a little bit at the time. See what I mean? Until the pain is very, very, very great. So a lot of you who <coughs> listen to me and suddenly get a inf sudden infusion of life, you, suddenly that little bit of right, you see, cancels out so much, gives you so much hope. You know, it's just like, new world dimension but after you get used to that nothing nothing it, it, it moves at a slower pace and don't lose heart if things don't happen tremendously quickly you know what I mean just keep doing it just remember that's 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 the root nurture it grow and 20 years from now you look back and you wonder where all this joy and happiness has come from see just in the material world let alone what is to be from that point onwards. The magic, we were talking about the magic earlier on. That magic, it is so incredible that you will, you will affect material things. I mean, I, it, you're driving along in your car. This has happened to me. And it's so radical that it happens more often than not. Things like, I feel that the, the, uh, the pistons are gonna come out of the car any minute. I stop the car, slow it down. Uh, that's the end of my car, right? knocking, banging, clanking. 
Uh, well, I'll drive it home, whatever, you know, I might as well drive it home, the engine's gone. I'll start the engine up. It's been right for 150,000 miles. You know, my speedometer fixes itself. I get a flat tire in front of my car, in front of my... Um, <laughs> <laughs> <It's> strange. <laughs> a flat tire in front of my house. I, I, I think to myself, I'd like to have that one day and forget it, and therefore, it, there it is. Or oh, it's such a cheap price, you know, suddenly someone says, hey, I've got this, I want to sell it. It's so cheap, I can't afford not to buy it. <coughs> you can always afford something that you can make a profit on, right? Even if it's, a, even if it's a, an express train. So it doesn't make much difference. If you can make a profit on it, you can't afford not to have it. See? You see, it is the most... You, you find that the, the, the consciousness that you have seems to be, um, if it's tuned right, interconnected with material things. When it's not affected by material and, this, and the spirit of the material that tempts you into the subjectivity to the material and its spirit, that suddenly you start affecting just by realizing what you want or realizing what should be, it becomes. It is happening, and there's no energy or effort put forth to bring it about. I guarantee you, it will start to happen. Every person sitting in this room, it's going to start to happen. Businesses will get better, your family will get better, your children will recover from whatever it is, they'll stop being rebellious, some of them may take a little longer. You won't hate them for it, because they see that you can't affect you anymore, and they say, what's happened to Dad, Mom? <laughs> see? Can't get his jollies anymore, right? <laughs> He's affected by the fact that he can't affect you. Wow, that's another Ollie North here. He either likes it and goes to heaven or doesn't like it, goes to hell for a little longer. But you don't hate him for it, you just wish you hope that he'd come back one day. Or if he's young enough, you grab him by the collar with that anger and know that you have, to, you have the right to pull him into your orbit for a while. That's your duty. You'll know what to do, okay? I still don't know what your question was. <laughs> Anybody else has a oh, look, it's just two minutes, we'll have to... We've got one more session. You rearing to go for one more? Mm -hmm. All right. No, just one more. Just one more. Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, for the audience, for the viewers, it's so uh, tomorrow evening, and uh, for the audience here, it's just ten minutes from now. But uh, if you're wondering what's going on here, and uh, you're beginning to pick up on the points that I'm making about learning not to be affected by material things, by people, places, and things, so that you can affect things, because most of your attempt to affect the world you live in is because the world you live in has already affected you and thrown you off balance. And this kind of affectation, this kind of effort, struggle with nature, the wills of other people, it's, gonna, it's like going down a drain. There's another way of doing it. Learn not to be affected and you will be affected. You will affect things positively. Everything, your family, your finances, you'll see clearly what to do. And you'll find it happening in that clarity with that effort. Hardly any effort at all. So tune in to our program tomorrow. They will flash on the screen how to get the material, how to not to be affected by the world you live in so you won't be depressed and unhappy and successful, healthy, and wise. Thank you for listening and join us again. Understanding. Here is Roy Masters. Well, here we are again. Welcome once again to the program, How Your Mind Can Keep You Well. And I'm trying to stay to the same subject. Um, the subject is, you can affect the world for the good if the world doesn't affect you for the bad. And the only way that can be is for you to be, on, be a creature, a renewed creature, renewed in the spirit through your mind from within, from that who created the universe and the environment to begin with. In other words, you, little old winemaker you, little old persnickety nothing you that's trying to be a something, struggling to be a something against all odds, against the immenseness of the universe and against the, the conniving and cunning of other men and women who are knocking you down to 
you know, crawling on a sea of heads to get ahead and doing the same thing much as you, trying to affect their environment, knock down, build up, build themselves out of your fall. So you, it's, it's just a big pit of slime. Everybody's sort of climbing on top of each other, getting to the, to getting to the top. You can't be part of that and expect to be a happy person. That you have to run your own race and you have to move at your own time, in your own speed, motivated by your own energy and not by challenge and not by set any goals or ambitions, but unfold like a flower from within, one event leading to another, a series of events, but by divine revelation. And you're all capable of it. You don't need the blessings of a priest or a rabbi or anything like that. You don't need me, although some people think I have something going for me and they appreciate my blessings. My son says, Dad, uh, I want a blessing. I have bus no business is bad today. He has a car lot. So through the telephone, I said, you got it. That same day, car sales go brisk and er he believes it, you see. And some, you know, well, who was it? Abraham and Esau? Well, wasn't it that he laid his hands on his son and the old, in the old days they laid the blessings, passed something from one generation to another. There is something that passes a blessing and cursings and, and it resides in a good father. And I, I hope to be a substitute surrogate dad to you, see, so that the blessing can leap from me, if you understand me, and hear my unvarnished truth, truth spoken without hypocrisy. That's all you needed to hear from a father anyway. He didn't want to sit him on your knee, sit you on your knee. I mean, he didn't want to cuddle from him like mama. That's mama's thing is cuddling and warm and ego supported. But daddy, he was about the business of bringing children to father. Daddy is about the business of helping you separate from the world and separating you from its sort of, its sleazy su seductiveness. To teach you to be not emotional, not affected, T to stand for what's right you know, against what's wrong. To love what's right, not hate what's wrong and think that's right. To learn to deal with cruelty and pressures and stupidity and confusion and temptation without resentment calmly so that you continue to grow as a child of light in the image of your father within and not in the image of hell by corresponding with hell angrily. And you see what I mean? Okay, that was basically what we were talking about with a little more thrown in to get the program started this evening. Okay, now. Yeah. About the not being affected, you were speaking of, uh, I heard you before too, about when people scan your systems and uh, I be becoming more aware and uh, scanning in a positive sense, you know, that doesn't bother me, but when they're up to no good, it really... You can sense it. I can sense it, and it gives me the creeps. Now, I know I used to resent it without realizing what I was doing. You, you resent it without realizing you were. Right. It was, your, in, it was your, um, your primitive way of dealing with things as a child. Right. But as you grow up and you become a mature person, you start to observe the resentment and the primitiveness of, of it and how it works against you right. to increase those pressures to make you conform. But right. see, the whole deal was, as I perceive it, to throw me off balance. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And then they got you. It, but now, so I go, okay, I'm, I'm doing something, and I like have to pull away from what I'm doing to not be resentful and to be aware. Right. And you see, then I've been had too. How? Well, I pulled away from what I was doing. Oh. You know what I mean? To, to, I have to stay aware, and so I spend the whole day kind of staying aware, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a... Now, that's, that is an interesting point, because you, by, by, you're trying to stay aware by your own effort, ah, as, if, okay. as if you could give your own self-awareness. But instead of coming into the awareness of God, you, being your own God, trying to make yourself aware. Now, people who have sleeping problems, maybe if there are, there's a certain condition, I don't know the name of it, scientists have all have, psychologists have the names for everything, but they know what it means. So they just give a label. You know, you've got Skyberus or the bongo. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> That's what we call it. It's what we call it. <laughs> it's what we call it when we don't know what it is. <laughs> Here's a cure for it. <laughs> you know? But uh, there's a condition of sleeplessness of people afraid to go to sleep because they're afraid that if they go to sleep and sink into unconsciousness that something will get them. Right. Or they may do something, act out some hate, murder somebody. 
So they try to stay conscious. They try to stay aware. And a lot of us, you know, I used to have the idea when I was a kid that I wouldn't die because I forced myself to breathe at the last minute. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Has anybody thought that? No, I'll make myself breathe and I won't die, see? <laughs> but I forgot my heart stopped. <laughs> you, <know? No. laughs> you cannot make yourself be conscious. That's why you meditate. Because you realize you need consciousness. You need to be awakened. See, There's, because there are only two conditions, a condition of denial, which alcoholics, people who make excuses, people who listen to music for escape, people who involve themselves with personalities, follow? Um, drug addicts, people who live in fantasies. There's a condition of denying consciousness to be that consciousness, because in your dream world, in your escape world, you are what, you, what you're really not, but you think you're that. You have a certain consciousness, but you're not conscious of God, but you're conscious that you are God. In a dream, you're not aware. For instance, if you were a dream, and suddenly you were aware that you were dreaming, you'd wake up. And then the dream would cease to have an effect upon you. But in a dream, which becomes a nightmare, the only reason why the dream has such an effect upon you is because you are affected by your own dream fabric because you think it's real. Why do you think it's real? because there's no reality to tell you that it's unreal, that it's just a dream. So therefore you react to it as though it was re real and you believe these monsters of the id are going to eat you or someone's coming at you with a knife. But no one is there. It's a dream and it's dream forever and it looks solid. But for the minute the reality catches up with you and sometimes you're in a nightmare and you know that you're asleep but you wish somebody would wake you up. But you can't find the reality to do it and you cry out in your sleep, <gasps> oh, but you usually cry for mother. That's the worst thing you could do, right? She put you in that state in the first place, right? The queen of hearts. <laughs> right? Is that right? <laughs> Alice in Wonderland, right? But you see, the thing is, there's only two places, consciousness. You cannot make yourself conscious. But you're going to want to be conscious. You want to be aware. And, and the gift, it's a gift to be aware. And the desire to be aware of, of the purpose, it has to be this way. I want you, God, to give me your awareness, your knowing, you, you know, your infilling, you see, your consciousness. Take me out of this sleep state. Take me out of this illusion and the subject of the id that's in this illusion, you see spirit, the force. That's the prayer. It's an inclination of the soul. And when the inclination of the soul is there, the, the light comes and lifts you into a consciousness and makes your dream, your, your nightmare, which is your life, see, to no effect. But you can't make yourself conscious. You can't give yourself that effect. It's not in your power. It's only want to be to exist for the purpose for which you were created, to know that and to do it or not to want to do it, and to live in a state of denial where you live in your dream slate, where you're, you think you are something that you're not, see? And, and constantly being reinforced in a lower, lower state of consciousness, because the more wrong you become, the lower state of consciousness you have to live in, so as to not to know what's happened, that you've got worse instead of better, see? So you can't give yourself consciousness, but the meditation is the act. It, it is the is the meditative point in your day where you separate, where you, where you, you, you have the, with the small amount of energy that you have in your life, you've spent most of your energy. With that small amount of en unspent energy, you start to move away, deny. God will give you a little strength to, to, to set yourself apart from that world. If your, your desire is pure, he comes into you and gives you a little strength. and, and, and suddenly you find yourself able to separate from your thoughts, from your dream state. And as you do, you come closer to that other world where your consciousness is made, is purified, your pride is dis dis disabled, see, and, and melts in the light of the light of the summer sun. And uh, suddenly you're conscious and, you, and your nightmare life starts to be like a, a, a nightmare, just dreams fantasies sort of flittering away and slinking into the darkness 
sort of still there, but losing their effect. See? So there's it, a gratefulness. It's, huh? it's more than through the meditation, a cumulative effect. Like at the at the precise moment it happens, I can feel I slip into that old psychotic state that I came yeah, out see, of. See, see, and then you try to force yourself to be aware, like right. forcing yourself to wake up. And waking up is a gift. Being aware is being immersed in the bosom of reality. There's only two bosoms. It's your wife's bosom and God's bosom. <laughs> <laughs> so you can sort of hide in that, you know, in the bosom of all other things that, you know, anesthetize your conscience and give you the idea that you're a man when you're a mouse, right? Right. Um, there's that willful borrowing for that feeling of being alive and, and right and alive not dead and right not wrong, right? Yeah. It's denial. Yeah. It's because yeah. it's, yeah. it's a lie when you feel alive when you're not and right when you're not. It's illusion based on feeling, reinforcement of forbidden experiences. It's a determination of the ego to derive those feelings, see, and lose oneself, it, lose one's consciousness of reality to be one's own consciousness that you are the reality and that everything's all right for a moment. It isn't. The next moment reality catches up with you. See? Now, it's only that motive that keeps you back in that burying yourself in other people's loves, in those, those fixes. But when the ego has learned its lesson and makes a turn about, about face, it's it now compatible with the, li the life of God, the love of God, and there's not, you find that you have the power not to do what you did before. Mm -hmm. Just one cotton-picking minute. I know that's wrong. I, I know I want to do it. I feel myself. It was groovy. I must admit it's, it, it's enjoyable. See, but I've learned that something's wrong with it. Something's wrong with that pleasure. There must be another kind of pleasure I can, but I've got to get through this one first. This is not natural. I can't give it to anymore. And, but, and no, this knowing is coming to you through consciousness, not through your own cleverness, and not through your own struggle to get away from the pain behind, behind the pleasure, the evil behind the good, right? See? So it's, it's giving you the strength, and you find yourself, you can let it go. You can let the, the, the temptation go by you like a, a box of candy. <sighs> Delicious. <laughs> but it goes right by you and then it's gone. Comes back again hoping it's gone. And you can smell the candy, but you're not into the candy. You can smell the aroma, but you're not into the smell, right? And the smell is not into you anymore. Because whatever you're into is into you. And all of a sudden, the experience is over and you feel freedom. You feel like, well, you better than you, feel better than you ever did indulging the candies. A better kind of fulfillment, a lessening of guilt, a feeling of, of hope again. You're on the right track. You say, just a minute, let me have one of those candies, please. This time you eat it, and it's just, it's just sweet. I was hungry, I, thank you very much. You don't indulge, see, it's different. You got, your, your relationship with things has changed. You're not, you're not rigid. I will never eat candy as long as I live because I'm for God. You're not, it's not the way it works. See? You can have a glass of wine, but you're not an alcoholic. See, you, you're, you know, he that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all his ways. So you, the evidence that you are coming through is that you can relate to things and it doesn't, uh, you're not enslaved to anything. That you, you can relate to it in moderation. See, the power of the moderation is consciousness, that you have the fulfillment you're looking for, so therefore you're not looking for fulfillment in drugs, alcohol, eating, wives, women. And then everybody, all of nature, knows that you are that way. And they cannot tempt you, and they stand in awe and respect. And you inspire that respect into them so they become as you. You're affecting your world for the good, they can't affect you for the bad you affect the world for the good. When you fall away from reality, you give power. You give your whole, you, you start to fall away from the inner reality, and then you give the power to the outer to use you as the instrument of creating this hell on this earth. You're giving them power to make you unconscious, to be used as an instrument of their purpose on earth. Yes? I want to say that tonight I became aware of more ways that I had been affected earlier when we discussed ambition. 
you also stated that uh, the woman, the housewife, says, I'm going to be a better mother than my mother. I'm going to be a better wife. I'm going to be a better this and that. I'm not going to be poor. Like I'm not going to be poor. Well, my thievery in my childhood went to school. I stole candy bars. I stole there money. And I was is. caught. And I was punished in front of the class. I had to stand in front of the class and say, I'm a thief. And then I... Um, this is good. I went into a woman's house that she had trusted me because I played the little Miss Prissy Good Good girl, and I was quite well at it, and I stole money off of her dresser. But the whole motive was to go spend it on candy. Food for that security. Yeah, for the, to reimburse myself. And I was caught then again and made to take her money and to admit I was a thief and to give her Nobody knew the underlying reason why you did those things. You weren't really a naughty girl. You had this insecurity, this poverty, this problem with your parents that, that it deprived you of food when you were a kid, right? Well, it wasn't really the poverty. It was the overall selfishness. It was not that we didn't have food. It's that she chose not to let us have it, that she could have given us a little more to sustain our growing bodies and our summer energy, no school and the activities, but she didn't. And I just realized tonight why when I get money that my my compulsion is buy, buy, buy and give everything to my kids. Buy, give everything to somebody. And you give them buy more than they ought to you spoil more them than rotten. they should ever you have. You spoil them rotten, yeah. right? And the biggest area is in food. So so that trying to overcompensate my desires to have what I couldn't have or what I felt I should have had. Now the variation to this theme is legion. Everybody sitting in this room can identify with that in their own form. But the principle's the same. That you're tricked into having an ambition, a goal, because of some trauma through which the spirit of pride and insecurity enters and is made good by whatever marriage, I, I'm going to have a marriage, I'm not going to have a marriage like my mother had. I, you know, I'm not going to be, deny myself food like my mother denied me food, so the whole, it's like this lady here. Your whole life is affected by these strange goals. Each one of you have your own silly goals, based upon silly securities, based upon a spirit of something entering at a moment of stress or temptation or violence. Right? Anybody else have any? You see, this lady's going to get better. When she walks out of here tonight, because she was bold enough, you know, to speak up, you know, and it, it expose it to the light, yeah. it's, it's going to go away. I felt, even fighting my beast that I'm totally aware of, almost all the time, when I choose to take the awareness and not be the beast that I've always been, tonight I, everything started fitting together. Every program had just that one piece that I had been waiting all my life to find out why I have no control, why I'm compulsive in that area, when my, my mental process says, you know, look at yourself and look what you're doing to these kids. Their teeth are rotting out. How can you, you can't say there's any love, you can't say there's this. How can you face yourself? And then the hatred would be reimbursed to myself. For there's my mother inside me, still managing, to deny the kids the correctiveness they needed, which would be true love. So, so whenever you, whenever you so, try to deny yourself, it's your mother holding you back right. from that thing, which makes you get angry, resentful, and make you want it even right. more. Even more. That spirit of your mother is inside you. It hovers over you like, a, like an eternal or infernal presence. Let me tell you about this infernal presence in you. It's just like the presence of God, except it's infernal. And, it's, and it hasn't got a defined form, except if you know it's your mother or the spirit of your violation in you. And it hovers in there, and whenever you feel its presence, you know, it exhorts you to do the very thing, to, to keep alive those same um, habit patterns. It exhorts you. It pressures you. It pressures you so you can form and become a rich person, or it pressures you, like the lady just now, not to, to deny yourself those, that, that food, 
because she knows she's eating too much. She looks in the mirror, she sees she's fat, and she knows that this is a terrible thing. But that which gives her to know is not a natural knowing. It's that which is like, just like her mother, denying her what she was denied as a, the very thing that made her resentful as a child and insecure and want more what wasn't good for her to have. What well, might have been good for her to have, but wanted more in, in an unhealthy way until she's just coming out of her ears. And still she's not happy with it. And all of you are that same way with, with, with marriage, with, with religion, with money, with knowledge, right? Something. But let me tell you this. That's the movement, that, that's the trick. Your resentfulness toward whatever it is. Oh, you know, your mother wears army boots. You know, you're stupid. Your little Johnny gets berated or belittled in the class. You'll be a garbage collector. So you're made to feel inferior. You don't have any money. You're poor, so you're made to feel that you hate poverty. So you try to become rich. But if you hadn't have hated poverty, if you hadn't have hated your mother for holding back on the food, you would not have felt empty. You would never have felt inferior, insecure. You would have never have felt it. That moment would have passed by and your whole life would have been different because you wouldn't be striving after and reaching beyond your grasp and keep falling and reaching beyond your grasp and trying desperately to make something fill the bill when it won't. See? And then struggling with it until you're drowning in a pit of your own muck. See? Whether it's alcohol, whether it's food or money, you can drown in it. And up through the muck comes hell like a hand to pull you down into it, see? It's almost like that. You're dealing with a spirit of, behind all those things that tease you, that promise you what can never deliver. You're dealing with an intelligence, a force, that makes you spend your life in all the wrong directions, all the wrong ways. Had you not resented when you were young, this lady's going to be better because she suddenly realized what caused her to be ambitious? What caused her to set a goal to go over here? and move away from what's over here, to go over there and to move away from where it's at, where it's all been all along. Now, it's a good p point to bring this little story to the end because we're coming to the end. How much time we got? It's about the, uh, I mentioned it before, but it's a good place to, to restate the story. And it's a true story about the poor Indian farmer. Sanjay, you'd love this. And uh, Sanjay's from India. He's now in our control room. A poor Indian farmer who couldn't make a living and he heard they were finding very beautiful diamonds. That some of the best diamonds in the world come from India. So he sold his farm and went to, to seek his fortune and never found it. And he came back broken 10 years later to his farm and he found it was a diamond mine. And it's, of course that's an isolated story but it illustrates a point he forgot to look at his own farm first. Hey, somebody else has got diamonds on their mind. Maybe I better start digging around here first. Now I'm telling you, if there's, you, it's not ambition is, isn't there. You know, it's if people say, you know, the kingdom of heaven is in the ocean. I say to you, the birds, the the uh, the fish are there first. You know, if they say it's in the sky, well, the birds are there first. But the kingdom of heaven is within you. But men do not see it. And it's around you, but men do not see it, you see. So seek first the kingdom within. Be still and you will know it. And, and don't set ambitions and goals. It's all wrong. They're all lying to you. People who teach you that are going to manipulate you through your reaching beyond your grasp. They get into you. And that's the end of you. And you'll need them for motivation. And you'll make them rich while impoverishing yourself. While you feel like you're living in a nightmare. They take your life and your energies. You'll marry a woman who will do that for you. And she'll take you for everything she's got, and she won't be happy with you either. Okay? Seek first the kingdom of God within you. And don't move away from the now, because it's there waiting to unfold. It's going it's to come, it's come out through you, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to prepare the way. It's going to pull things together for you, like like a cloud mysteriously coming together right in front of your eyes and take form. You just wait and see. Give it a chance. And get my material 
I have a magazine, please write for the magazine, $36 a year. You'll love the magazine because it's full of articles such as we have been talking about for people who want enlightenment. Send uh, support for the program. And if you want to um, sit down on these uh, tapings, please call the foundation. Phone number is, uh, will be on the screen. Please write to us, support us.